Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings. Audio only today, no video, even if you're watching on YouTube. But don't be afraid to smash the like button to the episode and subscribe to Mayo Media Network. Plus, there's an audio giveaway for anyone who wants to jump on the Pat Mayo Experience Apple Podcast feed. You leave a five-star review, you say something nice about the show, you leave your Twitter handle or your email address, and you're in the draw for a hundred American dollars, which will be given away on Monday's Pat Mayo Experience with Jeff Feinberg. So tune in then to see if you won after you leave the five-star review and follow everything that goes along with it. Like I said, like the episode, subscribe to the channel, and let's just get into it because Davis Maddock is joining me from the Take Cast today to explain a bunch of things I don't quite understand. Uh, and here's the fun part. I, Davis, I can't really push back on you on a lot of this stuff, so you need to be accountable for what's real and what's not with what you say. Um, I mean, I will, I will do my best. I also want, you know, I, I don't claim to be a financial expert. Mostly my interest in, in all of this is just, I find financial markets fascinating and, uh, you know, I'm always looking out to try and make a quick buck. So I, I, there, there will certainly be things I say that could be wrong, right? Could, that could just be not accurate. All right, good. So the people know this going in, but you know more about this stuff than I do. You're far more plugged into it. You're doing a lot of this trading anyway, and there's a bunch of it right now. I just, it's funny because I'm pretty plugged into the online world, but I don't understand any of this shit. And I would imagine that there's a lot of people out there who just completely like they hear about what's going on and like, that's it. Like when, when it comes to, I mean, as we're speaking right now, we're recording this on a Thursday afternoon. So maybe a lot has changed by the time this gets released on Friday morning, but like, is the Robin hood app like still down? You can't like buy certain stocks on it. You can only sell. You can buy and trade normal stocks, you know, quote unquote, normal stocks still here. Let me, let me, uh, log into my account real quick. So let me just click on, uh, DKNG, for example, I could buy this if I wanted to, uh, I could sell some of my DKNG, but if I went to AMC, which is one of the meme stocks, uh, I can close out my position, which means that I can sell the shares of AMC that I have, but I am not allowed to purchase additional shares of AMC, which uh, is, uh, fr quite frankly, it's uh, it's bullshit. So, I mean, you're one who rails for socialism at all times and regulation at all times. Um, why do you have a problem with this? It seems like uh, the free market should be allowed to be the free market, but it has to be that way across the board for everyone, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, my, my opinion would be that if you're at least going to pretend that there is a free market, uh, then, then you can't just change the rules because you feel like changing the rules, right? Um, so if if the market is going, and w what we all know is that there is no such thing as a free market. The the system and the the legality of stock trading and of taxation exists in such a way to keep poor people poor and to keep rich people rich. Uh, I I would say a, a huge chunk of people listening to this podcast are of that opinion. Um, you know, they, they think that the Republicans are corrupt and the Democrats are clueless, which, which by and large is true. And this is just the, the 900th example of the famous George Carlin line. It's a big club and you ain't in it. Um, but very, very rarely in American history, do you see things like this happen? So obviously like normally a company that was trying to defraud you and cheat you would do so in a nefarious or underhanded way as opposed to just coming out and saying, we're cheating you. So I guess my question is that what is the reason behind stopping this? Is it to protect the giant hedge funds that are bleeding money? Is there an ownership stake in Robinhood that you know maybe they're losing money at the same time? Because it would seem to me, like if you're this app, you would want as much trading as possible because you would get commission off of each sale that's made or each trade that's made. So they're losing money doing this, at least from the way that I see it. Am I wrong about that? Well, so Robinhood does not charge commissions for trades, right? So, so the, the entire thesis behind Robinhood was uh, we will offer you free trading so that we can sell your information to institutional investors, right? They, they, they sell 
uh, retail investment information to all these different um, larger firms. More specifically, in the case of Robinhood, a large investment firm named Citadel either owns part or has a relationship with the Robinhood founders. This investment firm, Citadel, was getting absolutely wrecked on GameStop shorts, which is, and I believe AMC shorts, though I think that is a little bit less clear at this point. But essentially, they, the the people who were funding or having a financial relationship with Robinhood were just saying, you need to reverse this or else, you know, we are going to get absolutely crushed. And the people at Robinhood, I'm sure, did a cost benefit analysis and said, um, we would rather spend the money fighting off lawsuits that we're going to get than lose this funding or this relationship with Citadel. This has to be good news for cryptocurrency, right? Well, yeah. I mean, why? I it, we we've already seen um, a, a bounce in in terms of cryptocurrency value today. Uh, it, it fell yesterday, but I mean, it, this this basically justifies all of the thesis statements behind why people uh, wanted to be invested and want to transact in cryptocurrency anyways, which is, uh, no one, no one can stop you. Um, you, you can just make whatever transaction you want whenever you want. Uh, I mean, even something as simple as the Bitcoin market never closes. Uh, it's actually true that Bitcoin has traded for more hours on earth than the S and P 500, just due to the nature of the market because it never closes. Uh, I brought this up last week on the show. Is that, are we past the point where people think that Bitcoin is going to be an actual currency or is it just a stock now? There, I mean, there are still um, some purists, certainly, who, who believe that Bitcoin is uh, a currency, something you can transact in and something you'll hear a lot is about um, the, the Lightning Network, which makes payments easier. I don't know. I mean, I never have. I, I well, I guess I have spent money on things in Bitcoin in the past, but immediately after doing so, I transacted more USD back in to Bitcoin because uh, I I didn't want to spend Bitcoin. I I would rather hold it. There there maybe is more future for stuff like uh, Ethereum and some of those other cryptocurrencies to be used more like actual currency. Yeah. So that was kind of the the point I was because I remember there was that article that got released like a week and a half, two weeks ago is like, you know, Bitcoin is dead. Uh, and it was a pretty catchy headline. I think it got a lot of clicks. I saw it trending and then people were like very triggered. Uh, Bitcoin people very triggered by a lot of things online. Or, or do you get yeah. mad when people oh. talk shit about Bitcoin? The only thing that makes me upset is when people should know better, but don't. Um, like when they say things about Bitcoin that are not true and then they, they do, they, they do the, uh, like, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I like the, I don't care thing. It's like, I don't, I don't see much value in being willfully ignorant of anything. So when people are willfully ignorant about something that has like, you know, uh, uh, uh what is it? Half a trillion dollar market cap at this point. It's like, who, like, why is it cool to you? to be ignorant like what's the what's the point that that's the only thing that triggers me but like i don't care if people are like oh bitcoin's stupid or it's too volatile it's like well whatever you're just costing yourself money at that point like that doesn't bother me but the point of the article was not that bitcoin was valueless or was wouldn't be worth a ton of money it was that as a currency and what it first started out to be is actually dead because it is just a stock and i kind of agree with that thesis yeah i mean the thing is is that Bitcoin can be whatever you want it to be, right? There was the original white paper, but Bitcoin doesn't have a government. Bitcoin doesn't have a board of directors. Bitcoin doesn't have people who who draft out a mission statement. If you want to transact in Bitcoin, uh, you're you're more than free to do so. But a, a large part of what people see in Bitcoin is just that it is an immutable store of value that uh, the corrupt United States federal government can't do anything about. When did you catch on to this GameStop stuff? Because I saw it trending on Twitter. And I guess that's the other part of it too, because it became a mainstream story like Jim Cramer is trying to explain it on Mad Money the next morning or the day after. But yeah. like real time while this is going on, how did you wrap your mind around, like, did you understand the entire cons? Because I'm still kind of cloudy on what happens. Like based on what I can glean is that there was a group of, so there was a giant hedge fund that tried to short 
the game stock date game stop stock and then there was mm-hmm. a group of people on reddit who were like traders uh that decided to buy up all of this stuff to kind of go the other way and increase the value of the shares and then it ended up going up and the hedge fund lost a bunch of money is that is that basically what it is well, do you know you know what a short is, right? Like essentially a bet that a tr- that a stock will trade at a lower price in the future. I I understand the concept of shorting a stock. I don't understand in practice how that actually works. Like, do I need to watch the big short again? Like, should I be buying a big short somehow? Somehow try to monetize how much Netflix is going to make from people watching the big short this weekend? Well. Essentially, a short is just a bet that a stock's price is going to be lower than it is currently at some point in the future. And then you you have a date that you have to pay the short out by. And these guys from reddit.com slash Wall Street Bets figured out that this group, Melvin Capital, had massive GameStop shorts in. And effectively, what happens is it's called a it's called a short squeeze. And there are, there are many more educated people out there than me who can explain even more clearly how this works. But effectively, uh, a short squeeze is a group of people, and, and generally this, this happens between uh, institutions themselves and not between uh, retail investors and institutions. But you, you buy up all the stocks, you go very, very long on these stocks, and so you make it that um, the short becomes incredibly, incredibly expensive because they're they're done. Shorts are done proportionally. So if you're off by a hundred percent, that means you have to pay a hundred percent the opposite way. It's it's a uh, it's a very risky business. Um, trading on options, trading on margins, not something I've ever done. I am I'm honestly too scared to do it. But these essentially these Reddit bros got had enough available capital to put this hedge fund out of business. I mean, I mean, Melvin, Melvin Capital had to file bankruptcy as a result of, uh, of these Bitcoin bros. So as a part of that hedge fund, when we're talking about like hedge funds going out of business and losing billions and billions of dollars, it's not one person's money. It's not necessarily even one company's money. Like, aren't there regular people whose pension plans, retirement funds are all baked into this? Um, like I don't know like, about like, I don't know about isn't, this specific one, but like, isn't there a real you know cost? I mean? Yeah, but isn't there like a real cost to people who've been putting away for their retirement when stuff like this ends up happening? Isn't this essentially a lot like what happened in two thousand eight? Um, so that's kind of a hard question because a lot of the times the when you are invested in a large hedge fund like this you don't necessarily get all of the dividends of their profit. It's like you you enter into an agreement with them that you are going to earn 5% on your money no matter what. And the benefit that they get out of that is that they can then use your money to turn whatever profits they may. Um, so in many ways, this is kind of just a, a retribution for you know how many dollars these large firms have taken out of the American economy over the years. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, so I, I don't think that is true hundred percent. Now, do people get screwed in the sense of my 401k? I've been, I've been sitting there in ETFs for the last, uh, 40 years and my ETFs cratered in value before I retired. Sure. Yeah. They, they could get screwed that way. So that's been the one thing that I've kind of noticed is that especially with the people that like I follow online. So, you know, the yous of the world, the individual people that like to go after basically internet money. And, you know, is it an internet gamble to go do this stuff? Absolutely. And it seems like people are profiting off of it in a big time. It's the people that are unaware. I feel bad for that all this stuff is going on, that they just might be losing their shirt, not even knowing it at this point. Yeah. Uh, so yesterday, you and I are recording this on Thursday, January 28th. Yesterday, we saw the market in general take about a two and a half percent dip um, in, in the S&P 500 and, and the NASDAQ and everything. But everything is back up today. Everything, everything rebounded. Um, looks like all, all the ETFs are back up um, that I own about two percent. And there's some individual stocks that are way, way up. Um, so it, it looks like the the confusion and the um, like fright that people had yesterday seems to be mostly gone. Okay, well, I guess that that that's a good news. I wouldn't want to see anyone like lose their home or their retirement out of this, and that would be, just be horrible. Like that's why I was well, thinking some about- of the. 
some of the Wall Street bet guys are going to some of some of the people who are involved um, with the with this are going to lose everything. I have less empathy for those people because this is their business and this is what they're trying to do. Sure. It would be the bystanders who, you know, were you know, reasonably, at least in their minds, trying to put away for their retirement or setting stuff aside, you know, trying to put it into a 5% growth year over year trying to thing, like taking a certain percentage of their paycheck every week, dumping it into investments so they can have something for the time that they retire that you know, I would actually, I do feel bad if people are losing out that way. You know, the, the wall street guys, like, again, this is their business. They, they made their bet. It's like, if I, if I bet on the super bowl and I bet $10,000 on the chiefs to cover minus three and they win by two, you know, that, that's my fault. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, the the larger thing that people should be worried about is just the the general health of um, the American financial system because uh, it's not healthy. So that's uh that's not great for people who are putting five dollars, you know, putting five percent of their paychecks away. But those people are going to lose their shirts regardless of what the guys from Wall Street Bets are doing if the if there is a, a market collapse. How is, you're in Kansas City, right? Or the, the outskirts I'm in of? St. Louis. You're in St. Louis. That's St. Right. Louis. I always forget that. Yeah, yeah. Has St. Louis adopted the Chiefs as a team now that the Rams are gone? Or is it just still Rams or just whatever? It's it's like no one no one cares about football here. Uh hockey. Hockey is the is hockey and baseball are the are the big things here. It's very it's very bizarre. Like, you know, the the one time a house I, I leave I the one time a week that I leave the house to go to the store or whatever, generally speaking, I will uh I'll throw on a Chiefs jersey or something. And no, I, I literally, I can't remember ever getting a comment about it. Interesting. So it's not like Super Bowl fever. I mean, you're a Chiefs, I mean, you're a Mahomes fan. So you must yeah. be like fired up for the Super Bowl. Very excited. I mean, I uh, I, I have tickets on the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl, obviously, um, uh, futures from earlier in the year. But what I think my, my new thing is like, uh, just like watching Mahomes become the greatest athlete of all time to the point where like, like, okay, no matter what LeBron James ever does, people who watch, you know, people who are, are, are 50 or whatever, they'll just never say that LeBron is as good or close to, to, uh, Michael Jordan. But I, I would like for Mahomes to be so dominant that the boomers have no choice and that they just have to say that he is the greatest football player of all time. And I, so I'm really enjoying that. Lo losing to Brady is not going to help that case. Correct. If he loses to Brady, uh, which seems unlikely to me, uh, that will not help. You are, you are a hundred percent correct. Yeah. That, that'd probably be bad news for that case. Cause he would be the guy that he's chasing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh the tra and and yeah, I mean then the you know the head to head and everything. Yeah, that that will not be that will not be good. I I think the Chiefs are a very bad matchup for the Buccaneers. So back to the stocks for a second. Yeah, it, yeah. It, with Robinhood shutting down, I don't know where the pressure is coming from and why they like you've said they've done a cost benefit of this, uh, and it seems to be pissing a lot of people off who have gotten into this uh, in terms of actual trading, like either yourself. I've just seen a lot of people right now. There was always sort of the protection to look out for, you know, the big Wall Street firms. But mm -hmm. with so many people diversifying and just independently rich, internet rich people basically having basically galvanized behind this, gleaned onto it, that is there enough pressure from basically the non gigantic firms from independent rich people who are either trading in cryptocurrency or buying these shares that there's enough pressure to, you know, maybe make some changes to this? I, I think the problem is, is they've already made their bed as it pertains to this like specific thing. So I, I think that it, let's say right now I log back into my Robinhood account and I am allowed to to buy um, AMC or GameStop. Like my my relationship with um, Robinhood is is done. Like I'm I'm not trading on their platform anymore. I'm I'm getting all of my stocks and my money off of there, and I assume. That that is the case with many people. Um, the 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 great the the great line that is going around. I and I don't want to take credit for this because many other people have said it. But if if a product is free, and it works, and and you have money on that platform, uh, you are the product, not the not the consumer, which is true 
as it pertains to Robin Hood. You know, our our data that was powering Robin Hood is, is I mean, it's coming home to roost now, essentially. What's the recourse for this? Like, people are going to launch lawsuits, but how is they that? They won't win, though. I mean, if they win, it's going to be like years from now, won't it? Like, isn't there, shouldn't there be some sort of like SEC fine for this? Uh, I mean, the SEC is probably likely to side with the the corporate interests. I, I don't, the, the SEC very rarely is going to side with, with the common man on something like this. All right. Let's move off this because, I mean, that's basically my general understanding. Thank you for explaining that a bit more to me, but at the same time, I still don't get it. Uh, of like, If you're not one of the first people in in pumping this stock up and buying it at the price, like who is buying GameStock at 300 bucks a share? I guess is my question. Like They're the people who are going to get screwed, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it and it did get up even higher. I think it did get up to even like $400. But yeah, it's people who find out about it late people who maybe don't understand exactly how, uh, you know, finance and stock markets work. I mean, I saw some posts from these Reddit threads, um, you know, from folks being like, I've never bought a stock before, but I want to be involved in this, you know, uh, how do I make an account? How do I get verified? You know, so on and, uh, and so forth. And I, I am like you, I am worried that um, it's going to be an uncomfortable ride for, for those type of folks. Have you gotten into what is it, Top Shots yet? Yeah, I uh, I love Top Shots. I mean, it is it is sort of all of my interests uh, condensed into like one thing, like internet investing, blockchain, NBA, sports cards. Like it's I I uh, I think it's great. So, where is the actual value? in these things is it in the blockchain part of it like i I can't understand how these are valuable whatsoever uh what do you what are you are you talking about the store of value like where does where does no like i let's say let's say i want to buy a top shots and it's like five thousand bucks and i buy it why is that worth five thousand dollars like how in the hell is that worth five thousand dollars for something i can go look up on youtube and watch why is um why is the mona lisa worth 20 million dollars you just look at it sure you you can't do anything with it but it's you know that is a an original one of a kind painting and it's a very historical painting at this point so it's very very old but i could i can i can i can google it i'm looking at it right now i'm looking at the a picture of the mona lisa as we speak true but you also very very moving but you are you are not looking at the original print of it and it's the original print that is worth the value what you have in buying like a highlight is something that's easily accessible exactly the same everywhere yeah i mean my my thing would be i'm i'm super into digital scarcity in general um like uh not these non-fungible tokens i think they're fascinating and i see just a very interesting market overall. Like I think this, I think this is a a totally fascinating market. And I think that this specific product, I think it's just going to exist for a long time. I, I think that um, they are, I think they've done a, a great job with, with the, the product as it exists. Like it's just very, it's very flashy. Uh, it immediately holds your attention. Like it's just, it's just really interesting to me. And the, the value comes from the scarcity. The value, you know, the value, and you can you can see exactly where uh, your your item originated. You can see its transaction history. You can see it on the blockchain if you want, which I think is really cool. I think you're gonna have to explain this to me more. I still don't understand how this is any different than me just watching that clip on TV. Like I I would get it, and this is what I was talking through somewhat last week when I was trying to wrap my mind around it. Like if ESPN had to come to you to license that clip, if they wanted to show it. That would be one thing, but they don't need to do that. So I don't understand what's original about what you've bought. What you, well, what you have bought is a unique moment that exists on the blockchain. And if it's, if it's something that like, I mean, I don't, do you own sports cards? Like any new sports card? I think I have a box of like old, old school cards at my mom's place from like 30 years ago, but no, I'm not buying new sports cards. That, that's a Feinberg thing. And that also seems like a real internet money type of thing at the moment. Like it, it's real hot. Yeah. I mean, it's I'm real not, hot I'm right not now. saying, 
I'm not saying it's not, I'm not saying it's not an internet money thing. I'm not saying it's not a fad. I'm just saying that to me personally, I think it's fascinating. Like I think it is super cool and it, it totally has captured my imagination for the time being. But is that because now does the value to you come from it existing on the blockchain and you believe in blockchain technology or is it just like this is a really cool highlight? Like that's the part that I don't get. I think it's a really cool thing that I can tell someone about the website. They can use it and they don't even really have to understand the concept of the blockchain to think it's cool and to use it. But to me, the fact that it's on the blockchain is awesome. And I just like, I love like the, mo like the moments I own, I think are, I mean, some of them I, I am buying kind of as investments, but some of them that I own, like, I just think that are really cool. And I like having the collection, but to me, I don't really get so much hung up on the idea of like physical versus digital. Like to me, it's it, the, those borders are so blurred anyway, that it just doesn't really bother me. So essentially it's like a digital card like the, the yeah. people, with Feinberg buying every Herbert that's available he could be doing the same thing digitally buying every Herbert highlight if those existed uh yeah but the I wish the I wish the NFL had this they would it would be like their most popular thing ever but they it does not exist for the NFL as of yet I'm curious to see if this stuff retains its value because it seems like right now like the, the market is just buy 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 this is new you know, you can throw in blockchain into it. You can throw the NBA, which is a very online sport to begin with. And it seems like you're getting all these investors and propping up this market. I'm very curious to see where this rests six months from now. Like if it's worth anything at all, it could be worth a hundred times what it's worth. It's just, I, to me, trying to understand it and how you've explained it to me, I don't, I still don't quite understand where the value rests in this. Uh, well, just, I mean, anything that someone is investing in online, you could just assume that the value rests in how scarce it is. Like that, that is just the, the general idea. Um, and, it, and if you, if it doesn't make sense to you, uh, I mean, that's what I've just been telling people is if you think this is stupid, if you think this doesn't make sense, then, then just don't buy it. Like I, like, you know what I mean? Like there, there are enough, I mean, this, the, traffic on this website like like is growing exponentially every single day so i i feel confident that there is still a group of people who are very into it overall oh no i see that there's a ton of people into it and the reason that i have questions about it and i'm trying to understand it is because the people that i see investing in this are generally the people that i associate with being either you know rich people smart people good investors but i'm curious now that if we're at the point with all of these different types of ways to purchase things not necessarily purchase things online but like digital only or very internet internet talked about internet-based stuff that if you weren't on the internet, you wouldn't know would exist essentially as a market, which I'm not saying is good or bad in any sort of way, is that are people just kind of scattershotting because they have a lot of money into all of these things and hopefully one of the 10 hits. So in 10 years time, like nine of the investments are going to be absolutely worthless, but the goal would be that one of them is worth a lot of money and pays for everything times 10. Like that's what I'm wondering right now. Is there one that's better than the other or does no one really know these markets are so volatile we don't know where they're going to be but these people have enough capital in general that they're okay with wasting it i would say that no one who is rich got there by investing in things they didn't believe in um so i would say i would say it is probably un unlikely that you know rich people who are investing in top shots are doing so uh, frivolously, that doesn't mean they're not, that just would be, that just would be my, my guess, uh, on the situation. But I, I, but I don't think it's necessarily dependent on one thing versus another thing in terms of what the product is. Like you said, this thing is blockchain based. So maybe someone is, you know, who's, who was big into Bitcoin, big into blockchain, that anything uses blockchain technology to verify that something is unique and real and secure is that anything that uses that technology, regardless of what the product is that they might just buy shares of or try to get in on in case this is the one that explodes irregardless of whether this physical thing the top shots is actually going to be worth anything yeah i mean that is how that is personally that's how i feel is i just i would invest in anything with blockchain tech 
that worked because I think it's uh, I I mean I think it's the future and I think there will be one of these products you know some some blockchain product is going to be a killer app that changes the way that people live online now I I don't I think Top Shots has a chance to be a killer app I mean obviously it's not going to change the way we live our lives online but I do think that it is a product that has like almost uncapped potential in terms of how high it can grow. What is, so if you were trying to give me your personal range of outcomes for this, what is the, you know, the max projection for you and what's the floor projection for you? Like what, what's a percentage this just goes to zero and it's absolutely worthless. Um, let's goes to zero. I would say something like, uh, five to 10% that it just goes, you know, that, that it's, it, it sits at zero and it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like your, your pogs that sit in the back of your closet. And then um, like, you know, two to two to 5% that it becomes um, the most dominant way to interact with uh, the NBA online. And that it, they develop like a, a sick fantasy game that goes along with the cards that uh, Top Shots is advertising, you know, with, with inside the NBA during those Thursday night TNT games, like two to 5% sounds about right. Is there a sport that could really break? Like if the NFL started doing this, would that make it far more valuable or is the more sports that get involved with this? Does it become, you know, not necessarily mass produced because each of these is going to be an individual moment. Like, could I buy Tiger Woods' putt at the players on 17? Better than most, like that one. Like, is that... Is that going to be in the future? Yeah, if, if if that existed for the NFL, the the NBA Top Shots market would, uh, I think, not have very much attention, and I think everyone would flock to the NFL. I think the thing you see with the NBA though is that they are just so much more forward looking than other sports leagues, and that's why they're there first, and that's why this is an officially licensed product. Um, I I don't I would imagine that some other leagues would would start to monitor this if it got truly truly like insanely popular but i don't i don't know if that is on the horizon yet um i do know that there was a there was a a front page story uh this last week on on nba.com uh with nba top shots like being explained essentially okay but as soon as nfl gets into this market everyone's nba stuff is going to go down in value yeah, I just I would project that to happen um, many many years from now, like many many years from now. I don't know the the NFL like, gener- generates a lot of revenue. If there's if there's a buck to be made, eventually they're gonna they're gonna figure it out and then smash everyone else in their way. They they do generally generate a lot of revenue, but that makes them lazy. They general they generate a lot of revenue without doing anything. And uh, I think that that could probably keeps them out of this space, at least in terms of official licensing for at least a little while. Now, now you mentioned pogs. I have you know the dust collecting on a mint con- mint. Condition. I don't even know what these are. How do you not know what pogs are? Are you that young? I'm I'm 28 years old. So yeah, I never owned a pog. You miss it. So the so pogs weren't banned at your elementary school like they were at mine. So I still have the very yeah. first set of official pog mint condition in a closet somewhere. Um, back at my mom's place or my grandparents' place. You'd have to think that with GameStop, AMC, Nokia, like, should I try, like, is can, can I buy, like, old school Blockbuster shares somewhere? Like, if all this stuff that's kind of irrelevant and worthless yes, is going you, up you in can. prices, that should, should I just start buying, like, are we going to see, like, another rejuvenization of, like, the action figure market? Like, all of this stuff? I think that's already a thing. I think action figures already sell for for some money i think they do but now that everything is kind of coming back around again like sports cards were worth a lot of money but now they're really worth a lot of money are we going to see that for all of these other like collectible type things from 30 years ago too um you might see like you know you'd be able to sell them for some money it's just like the market has a limited attention span you know but i i bet i bet you could sell the OG limited edition pogs mint condition still in the box for like some, some amount of money. I don't know. A nice steak dinner or something. Well, they're not, well, it's obviously not in the box. I had to take them out of the box in order to yeah. see if I had, the, cause you know, this was 1994, right. 1995. Um, you didn't just leave the stuff in the box back then you took it out. Cause that's 
Yeah. Was, that was the whole purpose of buying them? Yeah, that's weird. I mean, I, I, if I bought some collectible thing now, I would never take it out of the box. Isn't that sad? It is. It's super sad. Like, it, it, it's really sad. Yeah. Maybe that's the reason that I'm I not mean, like totally. That's a bummer. Maybe that's like the reason that I'm not like totally into this because I find the entire process just incredibly sad. Like all the stuff that yeah. was supposed to be made for enjoyment is now just. It, it's no different than again. I've done this to myself horribly over the years. Like everything I've had as a hobby and really enjoyed to do, I've basically yeah, tried to mo- money. I've basically tried to monetize it in my life, and now I just enjoy it less, and that's not good. Yeah. I mean, that is, uh, that's the battle when you, when you work online and you work in content is you, you do, you just want to, you just want to monetize everything. Like what, one of the main reasons that I stepped back from, like I used to do a challenge recap show every single week, which I really enjoyed to do. It was a fun show, but it took the fun out of watching the challenge for me. The challenge. Yeah. yeah. And I love tuning in. It's one of my favorite shows. It's an hour and a half. I turn on. My wife and I watch it. We sit on the couch. I'm not on my phone. I don't know what's going to happen. I sit through the commercials. I love watching it live. And now I'm back to doing that. I get real enjoyment out of it for an hour and a half every single Wednesday night now. Now that I don't have to, like, take notes during the show to think about, oh, what am I going to talk about about this episode? Like, there's nothing to do with that. It's now just a part of my life I enjoy again. And I, I feel like we're going to swing back that way at some point that all of this stuff that's meant for fun, that everyone has tried to monetize. People are just going to get sick of trying to monetize. There's always going to be people who are going to try to monetize it, but people are, are just eventually going to get fed up that they're just like sad with their day-to-day lives that they have no enjoyment anymore in anything. Yeah. That's like, that's like star Wars for me where I just have been like, I'm not, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do a whole thing. I just, am going to, you know watch watch the shows and the movies and whatever and i can talk about it on a podcast but i don't want to be i don't want to be too crazy with it yeah you don't want to be two hours a day down reddit deep dives talking about conspiracy theories inside of star wars you don't want to be that guy no no i really don't want to be that guy yeah yeah that would be that would be a nightmare but it does seem like there's a lot of people who have taken the fun out of everything in their lives i you know and like i said i worry about some of the especially with i think we're recording this on yeah, have you seen the Bell Let's Talk stuff? That the hashtag. Yeah, yeah. So that's mm-hmm. a that's a Canadian company. Bell is like a major telecommunications provider up here. So yeah, could, Alexander Graham Bell. Sure. I mean, he didn't start the company, but uh, you know, you can name stuff. He out. didn't. I don't think so. No. I I just I literally have for as long as I've existed, I just assumed that's what that meant. I mean, I think it's th- because he invented like telephone inter. What, what did Graham Bell invent? It was like intercontinental telephone service. I remember seeing the Canadian heritage moment of him. Was it up on Signal Hill? Or was it, yeah, I think it was up on Signal Hill, getting like the feed from England coming through. I think that's what it was. I'm no historian yeah. when it comes down to it. I'm I, no I, historian I, I, either. I think the company is just named after him, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I assumed he was, I guess it doesn't really matter. I assumed he was the inventor. Well, when was this invented? Let's see. Well, Bell Media itself was founded in 2011. So that's when it became like. So a, it's, it's just, it's just a, it's just a kitschy title. It's, it's not a terrible no. name. He, he co-founded the American Telephone and Telegram, AT&T. Okay. So I'm just trying to see. Bell Canada Enterprises merged with CTV. It's, it's just a whole bunch of different stuff now, like entertainment and telecommunications properties all rolled into one company that's called Bell Media. Yeah. So did we get to the bottom of the case? I don't think so, but, you know, that, that's kind of what we what we end up anyway. That's kind, of what, that's kind of what we do here. <laughs> yeah, we, we try to talk things through and then forget what we were talking about. No, the, the Bell, uh, the, the mental health... Uh, that that's what it means is the they donate like I think five cents per hashtag used to, you know, upgrading mental health and different nonprofits kind of thing. I don't know if it's worldwide or if it's just within Canada. Although the the hashtag itself and people talking about it um, tends to go more worldwide than anything. But I, I'm not sure if it's just something that's contained inside of Canada. Right. Anyway, there's there's a lot of that going on today, uh, as I've seen on my Twitter feed. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they do this, they do it once a year, right? Yeah, I think, I think it's always today. I don't know what, 
the 28th, the January 28th means, or if it's always a Thursday. I really don't know the impetus behind it, but you know, I see that it's out there. I mean, yeah, I, I would assume that people's mental health is uh, is about as bad as ever, right? Well, yeah, that that was kind of the point, like especially with people's enjoyment going down, trying people trying to squeeze every cent out of anything that they enjoy. And then just the overall mental health of everyone just deteriorating by the second as we get into, you know, almost a year two of the pandemic. Uh, can't yep. be, it can't be great out there. Like people should be talking to other people, whether it's, you know, an actual mental health professional. I think there's going to be an ad if people aren't listening to the like audio podcast of the show, but like betterhelp.com has been sponsoring the show on the audio side. So better health.com betterhelp.com code mayo get you a discount on like talking to it like an online actual therapist um and maybe you don't need to talk to an actual therapist about it but just talking to someone like i i've been talking to a lot of my friends uh, whether i'm calling them or they're calling me just keeping in touch with people like having some semblance of you know interaction just yeah anything normal it's really weird man it, it, it's kind of fucked up it's not even kind of fucked up it it's, is fucked it's up. It's extremely fucked up. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just uh, humans are our social creatures. We were not uh, built to to be home alone in our uh, our offices all day. You know. Do you think that people who the the same people I talk about, the people who you and me and people who work in our industry and just work primarily online, anyways, who have been trying to you know monetize everything in their lives as possible uh, to see if they can turn a profit out of it in this face of enjoyment, do you think that those people were better equipped to deal with what's going on right now because this is almost how they've been living their lives anyway? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, this is this uh this time frame in human history where people are are working from home and they're having to be more self-sufficient and everything like this is uh a lot easier on people who were predis you know predisposed to behave that way anyway so yeah 100 percent. have you bought any sports cards have you gotten to that yeah yeah i i, I bought sports cards uh not not like a, a crazy amount of them but it was it was actually because uh i was buying these moments and i was like fuck these moments are expensive they're so expensive and i could just i could go to i could i could just buy and buy and buy and never even get close to uh the the total amount of them that i want and physical sports cards are much cheaper uh there's a greater variety obviously you can you can buy other you know other sports and stuff so i it was it was born out of um it was born out of my my top shots experience how how much do these digital moments cost i actually have no idea well it, it depends on uh what type of digital moment there there are some that that sell for a buck uh there are some that sell for a hundred thousand dollars so it's it just there there's a there's a wide range what's the is there like an average cost of like a decent one like are we talking like five thousand bucks ten thousand bucks per like good digital moment like what what moment sold for a hundred thousand dollars like the lebron block down in the finals against the warriors it was uh it was a lebron dunk um uh a serial number one one of 25 i don't i don't know if that serial numbers are a thing in in regular card collecting as well um so i would say i would say there are three different types of cards uh common rares and legendaries uh, the legendaries go for you know anywhere from five thousand to a hundred thousand dollars. The rares are anywhere from a hundred bucks to like fifteen thousand bucks, and then the commons are like one buck to like like a, I think a LeBron, which is the best you can get. The LeBron commons go for about five thousand. Wow. Okay. Or five 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 hundred. My bad. Five hundred. All right. So the sports cards that yeah. you're buying, like, are you gravitating towards one sport in particular? I guess if you want to buy these NBA moments, you're probably not buying NBA sports cards. Well, I can, I can look, I, uh, I, I created an account on star stock, which basically they just keep all the cards at a warehouse. So you don't have to, uh, buy have, them. You, you don't have to have them with you on person. That sounds like fun. Yeah. So I, uh, I bought a bunch of prospect baseball cards, okay. like guys who could be good baseball players in the future. Um, I bought some autographed NBA cards, uh, Lugens Dort, Jackson Hayes, Kendrick Nunn, um, 
and I've been looking at a bunch of football cards, but have not purchased any yet. I'm going to try and buy a super expensive Jalen Hurts card uh, at some point. I can't imagine even baseball prospect cards at this point in the future being worth anything because people don't give a shit about baseball anymore. So people like uh, people in the grand sense don't give a shit, but card collectors do care about baseball. Just because baseball cards have been ingrained for so long, but I couldn't imagine for forever. But yeah. I can't imagine that newer baseball cards, regardless of how rare they would end up being, like you're always going to have your outlier. But I would think that in terms of a growth market, that it's always going to be the old, old, old baseball cards that continue to press the prices through the roof, where the new ones just probably won't have as much value as NBA or NFL right now. That is true, but I mean, you know, imagine if uh, if you you buy a prospect card and the dude becomes the next, uh, like you know, he wins the NL MVP in eight years or whatever. Yeah, but like you, you, you but just you, lock. But even if you had the Mike Trout one right now, like, what is the most expensive Mike Mike Trout card versus like the I don't know, like it, the tenth best quarterback under 30 like they're probably equivalent because more people care about the nfl right now and want to buy that no the most expensive trouts go for like millions of dollars do they yeah but i mean obviously that those are not the type of cards that i would be buying but yeah there there's a there is a one of one or and uh there's a one of ten mike trout that is go, that has sold for like 1.2 million dollars okay that's that's interesting to know. Who would be the next guy behind Trout in terms of baseball card value right now? Uh, I literally have no idea. Uh, probably Christian Yelich. Really, Rebel Yelich? I huh. maybe no, pro- probably a pitcher. Right there, there be there be some pitcher. I I literally wouldn't even know though. But isn't that kind of the problem? Yeah. No. No. You're you're right. That is that is the. That is the problem. Yeah. But yeah, I literally, I, someone you got tweeted us if you, if you're like, you guys are an idiot, you're forgetting someone very obvious, but I, I don't think either Pat or I have any idea. Like, would it be like Verlander or Scherzer? Like, I've been out of baseball for so long, I don't even know who the top is. Like, Tre- Trevor be, Bauer. It, it could be, it could be Verlander, actually. Yeah. He's got a lot, he's got a lot of, of name, of name cachet. People know who he is. I would just worry that the, a good call. that the people who are buying cards in this space right now, because it's not just your old school collectors who are going to conventions or going to like the, the local swap bait to find rare cards. It's people doing this online who are coming into the space for the very first time that I would just feel right. like baseball, unless it became so rare that people invested into baseball that all that stuff became super high price super valuable that i i just don't imagine the baseball market expanding all that large because people just don't follow baseball enough yeah people people don't care it, it, and any value it's like you kind of get yourself into these traps where it's like um i'm only selling something that's valuable to other collectors who then want to turn a profit on it in the future like that's what you have. That's what you get in these really small markets. So I would imagine that that uh, is probably problematic. All right. Anything else, internet money wise, you want to talk about? Is there anything I should be aware of? Uh, no. I mean, I am interested to see if uh, if people do actually take their money off of Robinhood. I I am literally in the process of doing it as I am talking to you right now, and uh, it's it's annoying and it's slow. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm curious if people actually have the wherewithal to stick through it. Do you think that they like what would be the optimal outcome for people that have bought, whether it's GameStop or AMC or whatever, the next one that gets propped up? Like the more people that hold the money, the better it is for everyone. Right. But if people start selling, it's going to go down. Yeah, for so for the um, for the big financial institutions to not get absolutely killed on their shorts, they actually are like they should try and buy some of the stock back and you know, that's what they're doing right now. But obviously if you won't sell, right. If, if uh, we refuse, if we refuse to sell, then uh, you know, what, what can you do? Right. Like there's, there's nothing they can do. You got to band together. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is the, the whole theory behind all of this, right. Just that if you, if you band together, 
uh, there's there's nothing they can do. I, which I don't know. I mean, I I think that the uh, the common man stuff is uh, is pretty cool, uh, even if it is not gonna not gonna work. All right. Anything to plug? Pump. For, what are you doing Super Bowl week? Uh, we'll be doing uh, we'll be doing our uh, we'll be doing our our Tate Cast prop show that we always do. Me or me, Sammy and Nate. We do the we do the Gill Cast. Um, which is which is always fun before the Super Bowl. So look out, look out for that. Uh, and then two weeks from now or three weeks from now, we're doing the book club with Patrick Laird, Miami Dolphins running back. Um, so really, really looking forward to to that for Radical Markets, which is the best book I've read this year. Great book. Good book. Yeah, great, great book. Especially if you are one of the people who are incredibly frustrated with uh the the financial markets and with both democrats and republicans in the government it's funny this is the first time that we've made it through one of these shows in ages where we didn't talk about it's funny that as soon as trump left office everyone just stopped caring about government and everything like i just look at my twitter feed i look at the top stories of the day everything that gets pushed through none of it's really political anymore yeah i mean i i feel less impetus to tweet because nothing I say is going to make Biden do a good job. Like he's just going to kind of be average. Um, you know, I'll continue to vote in my local elections and everything, but I just know I'm going to be disappointed by Joe Biden and by the Democrats having uh, the super majority. They're not going to do, they're not going to do a good job. They're, they're going to do bad. And uh, but he, that's but he, disappointing. But even if they do a bad job, it doesn't seem like anyone cares anymore. Uh, I mean, I, I still can especially with like the stimulus checks that they're doing right now. I, I think it's crazy um, that they, you know, don't have these stimulus checks out. Like, what are you, you know, what, what are you people doing? Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's like, they, yeah, I, you, you are right, though. It's like people just don't care if Joe Biden does a bad job because people just hate the president a normal amount now instead of with a pathological hatred. Well, that's the thing. Everyone who became these like political not not experts but like super interested in politics it was a hundred percent trump based either for or against now they just don't care they're apathetic to the entire thing yeah which uh i would say do you think that's do you think that is good or bad for the republican party i think it's a good thing for the republican party i think it's just yeah, a good I thing so I, I think it's just a good thing for people in general like if the if the democrats were super savvy and really wanted to push through what they could push through uh at like the most extreme level they could probably get away with it pretty easy right now they just they won't they'll try to they'll try to appease everyone yeah they'll and they'll just they'll feel it's just like they are so fucking stupid <laughs> they're so bad and and it's because they don't have they don't have uh, a central guiding ideology and and if you don't have that you don't really have anything. I mean, you cast a much wider net, and then any like equal election, you'll probably win because you have more voters. Yeah, uh, but I mean, American elections are are not equal. They're super rigged. It's oh. all it's all very jerry. It's all very not not rigged how you think. Just all just very gerrymandered. I mean. Like states like South Dakota only exist to give Republicans more senators. Was that that was the initial setup behind South Dakota, was it? Yeah, well, there's no reason for there to be two Dakotas. <laughs> it's that like 800,000 people live in the two Dakotas combined. It just so, but it exists to have more Republican senators. I see. I don't know if that's the case. I think you might be talking out of your ass with that one. No, that's that is legit. Uh, South, South Dakota, South Jerry, Dakota, Mandarin. Yeah, but South Dakota became a state when? Well, I think back then it just was for for conservative gerrymandering. Uh, I'll I'll also well I'll I'll find you. I actually was just reading something about this this morning, and I'll go back and find it. Was it from a verifiable source, or was it from like left wing history? I don't follow any of those accounts. It yeah. was. Uh, I'm sure it, it was some. It was some. Uh, it was some blue check, though, obviously. Yeah, like, uh, admitted to the Union November 2nd, 1889, the 40th state, South Dakota. So at the time, it wouldn't be, I guess conservative would be a much better way to say it, because at the time... Yeah, I, I, sh I shouldn't have said, I shouldn't have said Republican, just for there to be more conservative senators. 
And I mean, it would also, based on where it is in the country as well, you would just think that, I mean, that part of the country, the, you know, the upper Midwest just tends to go more conservative anyway, doesn't it? Like that entire region. Right. So but why does there need to be two, two states for, for a very low number of people? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about like, why isn't California split into eight different states? Why isn't New York split into four different states? Like, I, I don't know uh, the reasons all behind this, but I'm sure there's a reason. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, yeah, but like assuming those reasons to be, I mean, what, what is something you and I always say, like people are just going to act in their own self-interest. So, so acting like, uh, those are acting like the motives would not be ulterior seems foolish, right? Potentially so, but I'm very curious of like why the actual reason was. Uh, let's see. North and now, South Dakota you, were you, admitted to the I, union after after controversy over the location of the capital. The Dakota Territory was split into two. So that actually kind of makes sense. All right. I, I got it. I found it. What, I found what, the Atlantic article. What, so it's from the Atlantic. All right. So what, what is the thesis yeah. behind it? The thesis behind it is that uh, it was part of a broader GOP effort to gerrymander the Senate by admitting six thinly populated Northwestern states in between 1880 and 1890. So yeah, literally exactly what you said. The Northwestern states were going to be conservative states regardless. So they might as well get as many senators there as possible. Yeah, but uh, if that was the GOP type thing, wouldn't at that time, wouldn't the GOP have been more of the left-leaning party in the United States? Like, wasn't that still the party of Lincoln? Uh... Late here, this addition of 12 senators and 18 new electors to Electoral College was a deliberate strategy of late 19th century Republicans to stay in power after their swing toward big business cost them a popular majority. So no, that sounds that sounds like no longer uh, the party of Lincoln to me. Again, though, I am not uh, a scholar of American history. This was literally just uh, an Atlantic article I read this morning. All right, I, I'd want to deeper dive into that one to see what was really going on. Not that I, you know, now, now I'm kind of curious about it, of why there are two Dakotas and what the political idea behind all that was. And I'm sure that there was some sort of federal idea of, because there's so many native tribes up in that area too, that even cross over into Canada at the same time, that like trying to split them up geographically could hold power, uh, split them up into greater tribes, that kind of way, uh, you know, disperse them out between boundaries is probably just some sort of strong arm by the government as well. Correct. Yeah. I mean, just, just, if you just always assume uh, ulterior or nefarious motives, um, how, you, you, how, how often are you going to be wrong? I mean, you'd probably be right most of the time, I think. Yeah. So that's oh, kind of it's kind of where I'm at these days. So here, here we are. Here are the four on my uh, on my Twitter feed right now. Here are the four things that are trending. What's happening? Deshaun, Wa- they're the same. Uh, Deshaun Watson asked to be traded from the Texans. Okay. Um, the Winklevoss, just Winklevoss in general. Bitcoin. They've been being dipshits. Yeah. Bitcoin and the New York Times article of why is Wall Street obsessed with GameStop? Wall Street obsessed with GameStop. So ours are the same except for one. What's your extra one? I have a a different business and finance trending Dogecoin. What the hell is Dogecoin? It's a, it's a, a, a meme, but it's another meme that Wall Street bets is, uh, is pumping right now. Because they're banned from the stock market. Do you think it would be wise to, like, because you're going to hear about three or four of these coming up in the next week or so, that this is the next stock that people are going to be pumping up, like these irrelevant stocks, uh, these brick and mortar yeah. places that have no real currency in today's world, um, that this is just going to trap a whole bunch of people into investing into really stupid things and they're going to lose all their money. Uh, yes, people are going to invest in a lot of, uh, a lot of dumb stuff over the, uh, over the next coming weeks because they, they, their friend told them that they read in the wall street bets discord that this was the next one for sure. You're, you're correct. And, And Bitcoin is going to be a big proponent of this only because like you and I have been having these conversations for two years. Like you own a bunch of Bitcoin, uh, producer Paul, he owns a bunch of Bitcoin. I own zero. 
Bitcoin. And now I feel really stupid mm-hmm. that I don't own Bitcoin after everyone was like, oh, you know, it went from 4000 to 10000 Just like, no, it's going to keep going up. So yeah, sure it is. Then it keeps going up. And now I'm left holding the bag, but I didn't want to invest into it only because I didn't quite understand it. I didn't want to invest in something I didn't understand. I don't understand why any of this stuff is going up, realistically, and how the influences are going into it. So I'm not going to own any shares of it. But I think that people who feel like they missed out with Bitcoin because their friend told them, they like two years ago, hey, you should invest in Bitcoin, uh, and then they didn't do it, are going to feel the need to get in because their friend is now telling them, oh, you got to invest in, fucking, I don't know, like I said, like blockbuster stocks or something stupid like that. And then people are going to feel that, oh, I missed out the first time. They're going to have FOMO get in. It's just not going to work out because that's usually how this stuff plays out. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel I feel for those people who are who are going to have the FOMO. My my thing to them would just be just, just buy Bitcoin instead. Or if you demand to be invested in the S&P 500, create a wealth front account and just put your money there. Okay, there we are. Davis Maddock. I'm going to be doing a prop show as well with Cust and Jeff. We should do dueling prop shows to see who hits more props. Uh, you you guys will hit more. We we just love we love all the uh, all the terrible ones. You realize that I'm talking. Like all- you realize that Cust is on my show, right? He bets on the fucking yeah, coin flip true. every year and then calls it free money. <laughs> Is uh is Cust like is he even someone you can talk to these days with uh with the potential incoming of Deshaun Watson to the Jets or is has he just completely lost his mind? He's completely lost his mind, but he's pretending like he's keeping it together, and it's pretty funny. Like he he feels like he's being very reserved, but he's not. Like and it's all just, but he's not at all, it, yeah. not at all. But he thinks he's keeping it together, which makes it even funnier. Um, so it'll be fun to have him back on the show next week. Now that the jets are the current betting favorites for Deshaun Watson, which is just going to be hilarious when they don't end up getting him. And then Miami gets him. Then he'll say that Deshaun Watson was never good anyway. And he never wanted him because that's usually what happens to Tim in these circumstances. But you no, know, the, the stuff that he bets on, cause he always, he always tries to bet on the coin toss. And he's like, Oh, heads, heads is free money or tails is free money this year. But when you bet on the coin toss at the super bowl, it's like, Oh yeah, you got to bet like minus one Oh five or minus one ten on. It. I was like, why don't you just, just flip me for a hundred bucks and that way neither of us are paying big he's like no i don't want to do that <laughs> it's, it's really stupid he's, he's got it he's got to beat the bookie it just that that stuff doesn't make any sense to me like it's just a complete fundamental misunderstanding of odds well that's kind of tim's bit though right that is his bit but you'd think at some point he'd want to you know pay less fig no he, he that like that's literally his entire bit yeah i guess like, he should he, like if he if he ever started to understand basic things like that he would be much less entertaining he would what if he got like what if there was just a flip like we started football show next year and all of a sudden cuss was super sharp i think people would hate it i think it would be an interesting read like it would have to be a complete 180 though it couldn't be like somewhere in between it would have to be from like what cuss is now to warren sharp (laughs) yeah that's the only way that it would be any good and i still have a sense that people would hate it yeah, people people would be pretty triggered by that, but that's that's the part of Tim. Like he, he triggers people. Yeah, he triggers people. That's what he does. So you just got to let it happen, I guess. Yeah. All right. Thanks yeah. everyone for tuning in. All right, man. Davis, thanks for being on. Yeah. People should go subscribe to the Take Cast. Uh, who did you have on this week? I had on Kevin Cole from Pro Football Focus. We we talked a lot of football stuff, but uh, he also like you not not uh a believer in in top shots oh really so i, I it's funny that they're I, I i just it's not necessarily that i'm not a believer in it although i know that's how it sounded like i've come off i just i still don't quite understand it yeah he he was more along the lines of not a believer of like this is not cool well no that's probably not fair it's probably not fair to criticize him to to put it that way it's just he, he does not see the long-term value in it he, he feels like Maybe there's some short-term money to be made. I think I I would probably agree with that assessment more than this is going to be like super valuable five years from now. I think that's probably more the way that I'm leaning after we've kind of talked this through. But thank you for explaining all this stuff to me. I I hope that you explained it properly because I'll just sound like an idiot now. I I, I hope I did too. Well, that's always the fun of these shows. Um, Thank you very much. 
for tuning in, everyone. Subscribe to Davis's TakeCast. You can search that on Apple Podcasts. If you leave a five-star rating and review along with your Twitter handle and or email address on Apple Podcasts, you are in the draw for 100 American dollars. And Davis just told me he's going to give you one full Bitcoin if you go do it for his show. Is that correct? Uh, not correct, but I'll, I won't say I won't do it. Okay. So it's possible. It's po- there, there is a possible. I will actually be giving away the $100 on Monday. I'll be drawing a winner. We'll be announcing that on the golf show with Jeff. So please go support the show in that realm. And that would be, uh, I'd be very grateful for that. So thank you for supporting us. And thank you for when we mentioned on the last show that we imagine that there's one person out there that really enjoys when you and I do a show together. But I got like 50 responses that people really enjoy when you and I talk. Yeah, they do. They love it. Uh, God, God help them. God knows why. But, you know, you guys all make it possible for uh, for Pat and I to do this show. So so we bigly appreciate it. Huge. It's very people say it's very great. When we uh, and Trump impressions. They do. That's Trump, what they say. Our Trump impressions going to become like the new Borat. Uh, no, man. I mean, when's the last time you even thought about Donald Trump until that moment right there? I don't know. I, I, I gotta say, I still like doing the, the impression. It's one of my favorite things. But I still like the Borat yeah, impression. No, the, I just latch on to these the, things. The the impression is funny, but I, I really think that just no one cares. I, I really think that is where we're, I really think that's where we're at, is people are just like, you know what, we're, we're over uh, the Donald Trump period in our life. Does that mean that in two years' time, if there's rumblings about him running to be the Republican nominee again and like going through the primaries and everything like that, that people are not going to be interested in Donald Trump? Or is it just going to go back to the way that it was? It's very hard to say with those people, man, the, the Trump people, like, but it, but, but, like literally, but, but, but it's not, but it's not, it's them. not just the Trump people, like the just general interest in Trump. And like to say that it was just Trump yeah. people, that's one thing, but also whether it was Fox news or CNN or M- MSNBC, they got ratings because Trump was saying crazy shit throughout the primary season. The first time running for president, being president, like he was a ratings machine. You don't think that they're going to like glom onto him again. You know, it just ended so poorly, you know, police officers getting murdered and stuff like I I just I just don't know. I don't I feel like I'm going to place my trust in in the American people. (laughs) Good good luck. uh, Uh, We've now taken the reverse stance. (laughs) Yeah. As I'm saying this out loud, I'm like, Davis, where are you? Of course, of course, they're just going to welcome him back with open arms and it's going to be a nightmare. Oh, once they start printing money because the ad revenue is up and people are tuning in again after no one cares about Joe Biden. Absolutely. Yeah. No, you're you're you you couldn't be more correct. He's going to be welcome back uh, with open arms. Yeah. Well, there's a fun note. There's a fun note to leave it on. Anyway, I'm Pat Mayo. You can follow me at the PME on Twitter. Subscribe to Mayo Media Network. Leave the rating and review. And I'll be back on Sunday with a first look for golf. And it's Super Bowl week. We got a ton of golf waste management with limited fans, not a crazy amount of fans. So jam pack week on the show. Stay tuned. Experience. Experience.